Hello, everyone out there on the live stream. Hey, Paul. Hey, Barry. Hey. Hello. Hey, great to have you both here. Those of you on YouTube, please drop your comments and thoughts in the live chat, and we'll try to make it part of your show. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let's kick this off. Barry and Paul, welcome to Talk Python to Me. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's super to have you both here. Now, Paul, you've been on the show before, and we've talked about a few things. Barry, I don't think I've had you on Talk Python, but we had both of you on Python Bytes at a live PyCon. Do you guys remember that? People got in a room. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no one was like frightened when you would get somewhat near them. They wouldn't run away. It was it was great. Good times. <laughs> Those were good times. That was a lot of energy uh, back yeah. before you did live virtually. Is that what you call yeah. this? V Live, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was really cool. I mean, we had that at the PyCharm booth. Actually, we had like the whole broadcast thing going on there. It was a lot of fun. We'll yeah, do it again. It really we'll get back to this. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how you two feel about it, but to me. PyCon and similar events. That's like my geek holiday. I get away and I get to learn stuff and make professional connections. But I also get to see all my friends from all around the world and just share stories and have a beer with them when I would just never otherwise see them. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was just talking about this recently, you know, of course, missing PyCon in, in person. But I think when I learned, for me at least, the hack of PyCon, which was realizing that, you know, all the great talks were online and what, you know, and, and there was still a few that I would go to, but where all the real value for me at PyCon was, was talking to people, the hallway conversations, the energy and the synergy of ideas. Yeah. Oh, you're, you're looking into that. I'm looking into this. Look how, you know, that stuff goes together. So that to me was really the value of PyCon in person. Yeah, I, I totally agree. That's why I would go as well. I, yeah. My my best part is walking down the hallway with Barry and watching <laughs> thousands of people come up and say, oh, my no. God, Barry, I love you so much. No. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, Just, now, I mean, every continent, Barry is loved. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, not, was, this is not my normal BS. This is actually literally <laughs> true. Like real BS. <laughs> uh you yeah, know, it's it it really, really funny because, you know, walk, you know, walking around um, with Guido, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and Guido is the rock star, you know, of the mm -hmm. Python community in a lot of ways, of course. Um, and uh, I felt I always felt like I was playing my bass player role. <laughs> in, Py in Python too, it was great. Oh, you know? yeah, yeah. I'm just yeah. back here doing That's my perfect. thing. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a beautiful supporting role right there. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, bringing the music along. <laughs> so, fantastic. Well, we're going to get back to these conferences and uh, these get-togethers. I know we will. And I'm even going to try to get the most out of the online events. Like, I, I registered for PyCon, and I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to try to make the most of it. Yeah. Now, before we get into the main topic, um, maybe you guys could tell yourself, uh, tell everyone a little bit about yourselves. You know, Barry, how did you get into programming in Python? Oh, well, I got into Python in 1994. I had just been hired uh, at CNRI, and we were starting at this project called uh, the Nobot Programming uh, Environment or something like that. Uh, okay, these, what was that? These were little software agents that were supposed to travel around the internet and get a little bit of information here, package themselves up, move over there, do some action over here, and move around to a bunch of different nodes. Uh, this was an important part of the CNRI's digital uh, library initiative at the time. And Roger Massey, who was my colleague at, at CNRI, uh, we looked at, we were using a next, uh, next step and objective C and sort of doing that. And then, you know, I had worked at uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology earlier in my career. And I still had friends there. And one of the friends, of course, Paul knows Ken Manheimer, who is the unsung hero for where I, you know, where Python is because he's, he crops up in so many places, you know, and Every I, I Emacs RC file on the internet. Goes <laughs> yeah, back right, to exactly. Uh, I haven't talked to Ken in, in a long time, but I hope he's doing well. Cause I, mm. I would, Ken, Ken's a great guy. So Ken was still at CNRI and 
he forwarded to me an email saying, hey, this Dutch guy's coming over, you know, to talk about this he's, language that he's he bringing a crazy language with no <laughs> yeah, semicolons. Exactly. Exactly. So we kind of pulled down Python at the time and played with it and went, oh, this is this is pretty interesting. So, you know, it was close to where we lived. So we just cruised up to to uh, Gaithersburg, Maryland and uh, spent three days at uh, the first workshop, which, of course, Paul was at as well. Um, he can talk mm-hmm. about his experience. And we just like totally fell in love with Python, uh, really you know, resonated with Guido and what he was doing with the language. And, you know, long story short, ended up hiring Guido, uh, bringing him over to the States. Oh, fantastic. You know, worked with him at CNRI for eight years. An important part of the story, Barry, is CNRI meant something. Yeah. This kind of, it viewed itself, I think it viewed itself as kind of the steward of the internet. Well, of course, you know, CNRI was run by uh, Bob Kahn and Vince Cerf uh, at the time, uh, and you know, ran the IETF meetings, which yes. of course are all the internet, you yep. know, internet RFCs and things like that. So, uh, and it was a not not for profit research yep. uh, shop. Mm-hmm. So, it really was kind of well positioned to be Python's home for for all those years because. You know, there wasn't any sort of commercial aspect to it. It was all not not for profit, and it was really, it was a you know, Python was a really good, um, you know, piece of technology. I think, and I think CNRI was a really good home for Python. Yeah, for and, it was, um, it was a good breath of fresh air in terms of you know, like compared to C at the time sure. or this fledgling Java thing that some sure. some company made up. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you? And, how, how did, a, com- a comment I was going to make on that is you know, Barry and I give this talk, uh, nineteen ninety Python nineteen ninety four. We wear our shirts. Right. We didn't wear our shirts tonight. No, yeah. although. And um, each time I kind of <laughs> learn, I see, it, I learn a little bit. Oh, more. I love it. <laughs> Level of Python. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I got this. Every, I'm sure you have every shirt. Yeah. Um, but the, it, there's kind of this. It's a narrow run thing. The sequence of dominoes. And the fact that you were at CNRI and then CNRI was a place to go, if it would have been some other place, who knows? If yeah. you wouldn't have been at NIST before you landed at CNRI and the Michael McLay connection at, at NIST, who knows? Yeah. So that, that's an interesting point. As much as you try to plan your life out and, and guide it in directions, these little happenstance experiences are sometimes the biggest pulls. And, you know, uh, I had... I had it come out to California a few months before I joined CNRI and Mm. I interviewed with a company called Lucid. I don't know how many people remember Lucid, but Oh yeah. They had this nice compiler suite and they were using Emacs. They had a, they had a fork of Emacs that they were using. UI, And I, that was a version of Emacs that I was using at the time. So I came out here, interviewed and ended up not moving out here. Which was also another one of those fortuitous, you know, events in in my life, certainly, because sure. then just a couple months later, I ended up at CNRI, and then a few months after that, met Guido, and just you know, took off from yeah. there. So uh, you just never know. Yeah, you never know. Yeah, and that's Paul. such an interesting time. You know, Paul talked about being like the shepherd of the internet, right? Nineteen ninety four. Well, a year before, that's when the graphical web HTTP whole that whole story came around. I remember seeing. Um, mosaic the first time and just seeing what the, the web was and I was supposed to go to like a physics class or something like an evening physics lecture and I'm just like I'm skipping my class I have half <laughs> I cannot believe that this is a real thing I'd been on gopher and archie and all of these things and telling it I'm like I'm, I'm seeing like an entirely new world I was so powerful to me to see that so like that's like in the same time that all this is happening yeah but it was a pretty magical time I think yeah, it was. Uh, it absolutely was. Let me uh, just highlight a couple of things real quick before we move off your introduction. Uh, you were interviewed as part of this really interesting story, Python is Eating the World, how one developer side project became the hottest programming language on the planet. <laughs> so that was a really cool article. I remember that. And then... Hey, you know, Barry, you look good in that photo, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, his colleague does. So... Uh, and then another thing that was really interesting was the Pep 8 song uh, that... 
uh, Leon Sandoy recently released came out yeah. and I was like, Oh, what a cool, clever idea. And then I realized today that you wrote, uh, and recorded the Zen of Python as a song. Just, yep. just, uh, nine months, at least you published it to SoundCloud nine months ago. That's a really cool song. Uh, I'll, I'll share the link with people so they can check that out for sure. Yeah. And there is a, uh, there is a, I, I did a, like a, you know, a quote unquote lyric video, you know, where I had, I, I basically did it in an iMovie. I took that soundtrack and <laughs> yeah. I put, I put the Zen of Python lyric, you know, yeah, I call them lyrics, but which I think we have to give a lot other of people call it import this or something like that. Yeah, yeah, import yeah. this, which of course comes from Tim Peters, who's yeah. uh, you know even predates me in in the Python land, you know, and and Paul too, I guess. Uh, I think Tim was involved in Python almost from the beginning, you know, yeah. uh, and you know he was of course our colleague, you know, as we were in Python labs and you know and so on and so forth, so. Uh, and Tim wrote the Zen of Python. So. Yeah, yeah, it's really neat. I think that's a an interesting set of principles there. All right, Paul, how about you? Uh, this is the how did I get into Python question. Yeah, okay. maybe programming. I mean, you know, you told the story a bit before, but uh, yeah, it's yeah. Just like how do you get into this whole programming thing? Um, a cool program at school where we had a lab that had a bunch of stuff. The Commodore Pets. TRS-80. But the one that really stuck out to me was the, a deck teletype connected to a mainframe at the university <laughs> 200 miles away. And so... You probably didn't even have to log in to connect to it, right? It probably wasn't even... A, it probably log like, in. Exactly. You just connect. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you I, I got my own port. We're good. <laughs> yeah. And so a modem. And what freaked me out was... This modem is connected to the mini computer or mainframe or whatever. But if you called this phone number, this phone, from this phone five feet away, it was a long distance call. <laughs> <laughs> and that used to matter. Do you, that's also a thing oh, I kind of yeah. forgot, right? It was yeah. expensive. You're like, oh, yeah. there's this really sweet BBS that's got this information I want, but it's in another state. So we can only sure. talk to it for so long. And, you know, you better hope you got 9600 mm. baud not 300 baud or whatever you're going to get crazy but, uh, my briefly my python origin story is um so navy officer uh, working in Pensacola for a great guy named jim glenn 93 we did uh www.navy.mil a source of infinite funny stories some of them true um <laughs> And uh, there was a scripting, you know, it was pre-CGI, but the same idea, you fork, standard out, standard in. And some of the people were writing their, their web server stuff, dynamic stuff in C. Not going to do that. Some were doing it in Bash. Not going to do that. So Pearl, you know, I have this vivid memory. This story is true. A uh, vivid memory of going to the bookstore, going to the computer shelf. It wasn't a section. Get in the Pearl book. I like. I can remember where I was standing. I'm like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh hell no! <laughs> Put it back on the shelf. And there was this downloadable tutorial for this thing called Python, and it was a scripting language. So it didn't reach for me. And damn, if that thing wasn't written for my brain. Yeah, it was like perfectly the entrance for yeah. me into this. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I think a lot of people Python connects right away. Yeah, it yeah. depends on your history. If you if you've been writing C languages for a long time, you sure. have to sort of break the paradigm, right? But you'll get there. It's it's funny that Paul talks about Perl because you know I have the classic Perl book. And I was into Pearl and Tickle, and I and I know this you want to ask about this, the Camel Book, and it was totally dog-eared, and you know the spine was destroyed, and uh, because I could never keep Pearl in my head, <laughs> and I think I have the first Python book, and it's like pristine, you know, because <laughs> Python just kind of fits in That's your head. That's a good story. You know? That's yeah, exactly. yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Before we move off your introduction, Posh, I want to give a quick shout out to two things that you and I did recently that was fun. Uh, people might also like. Uh, so you and I did when I got my Apple Mac Mini M1 back in December. You and I did a, a nice walkthrough sort of exploration. Like, well, can you 
how does Python work over here? Can you run uh, Jupyter Notebooks? What's the Ripple like? And it just we compared a bunch of stuff, and that was a whole lot of fun. So I'll link to that as well as we also did a over at JetBrains where you work. We did a, a cool webcast. So let's build a fast modern Python API with fast API, and we just built that out. And uh, if yeah, I you may got, say, yeah, Michael set the all-time JetBrains record for webinar attendance. It lasted one month, but you held it for a month. Hey, that's awesome. I mean, <laughs> so so cool. Thanks for having me over there. But now I want to take you all on a journey. I want to start you to take us on a journey. Check this out. Hmm. You guys remember Ooh. that? <laughs> oh, yeah. So what we have on the screen yes, here, folks, hey. is, is I couldn't get any earlier than 1997, but this is the 1997 <laughs> python.org. And it's got the original Python logo, which is like um, like a, one of those light board type things. And it talks about what Python is. So Python is this interpreted, interactive, object-oriented, extensible programming language. And it provides an extraordinary combination of clarity and versatility. It is free. It runs on Unix, PC, Macintosh, and others. And it's really interesting that it describes itself as free and non-proprietary, right? Like even it almost predates this kind of Zen of open source side uh it's just you know Guido built this thing he doesn't want it to be corporate and want it to be commercial how can we build it as a community but it, so it was really blazing that trail right mm -hmm. it's pretty funny i see the sixth international python conference there and grail that's grail a, that's a, that jumped out that's a me. story yeah <laughs> that is a story that's an episode oh yeah, yeah. the final yeah, version yeah. of grail 0 0.3 is out Incredible. Yeah. what's grail Grail was a Python, completely Python-based uh, web browser that ran. Okay. I think I think it was we used Tickle TK to render. Um, the interesting story there, at least the way I remember it. So you know, it could all be lies. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> was you know we it kind of fit in with this notion of these software agents because. We had this idea, I think it was around the time of sort of Java in the browser, uh, but I don't remember exactly the timing. General Magic was the ones that were really pushing the mobile code thing. Yeah, so the, the idea was we wanted to be able to run Python in the browser, right? And uh, Bob had come, the way I remember it at least, Bob had sort of had this idea about the same time and came to Guido and myself and the team and said, wouldn't this be a great thing if we had, you know, Python running in the browser? And Guido was pretty much like, yeah, you want to see it? You know, <laughs> he had already done it, right? <laughs> so, uh, awesome. you know, right about the time Java in the browser was happening, you know, Python mm -hmm. in the browser was was working. So that's what Grail wow. was. How interesting. I think that even predates JavaScript. Yeah, I think it does. Yeah. I think that's actually. 97 or something like that. I can't remember exactly, but. Yeah. I can't tell you how much how much time I wasted trying to get tables working in Tickle TK inside of that Grail thing. <laughs> a layout engine in Tickle TK. Yeah. Oh, oh my goodness. It's brutal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a couple of thoughts on what you guys are saying. John Sheehan says, just fits in my brain. It's probably the most quoted reason people like Python. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Jessica's pretty pressed at the age of this page. Yeah, that's like, think about how easy it used to be to do web design. You're like, okay, I can bold that section and we'll put a horizontal line. Like, wow, you're a designer. That's incredible. <laughs> it was so bad. It was so bad that it was uh, like this opportunity. Really, really, really interesting. So, you know, let's let's jump back there. You know, like what other, we talked about some of these technologies, Perl and Tickle and so on. And the reason you guys chose 1994 is this is when the first Python conference or workshop happened, right? You kind of uh, partially mentioned that before, yeah? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's certainly when I met Paul and, and uh, Jim Fulton um, and a lot of, you know, Skip Montanero mm -hmm. uh, at the time, uh, Stephen Majeski, right? Uh, yeah, Robin Friedrich. We can Robin Friedrich. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there was only twenty of us at that workshop. Yeah, yeah that's what I was going to ask. You know, I go to PyCon and it's selling out the Cleveland Convention Center, and who knows what it would have done in Pittsburgh if that ever happened. But yeah. you know, it's it's a really big gathering. Like I am my 
my voice is gone. My legs are tired from walking. <laughs> and I, you know, I, maybe it takes me multiple days to get through the expo floor. Right. Yeah. It probably yeah. wasn't like that on the first, first one. Right. It was. No, it's just, you know, like I you said, know, I mean, I joke about it. When we heard we had room for 20 people, we we're like, wow, what were we going to do with all this room? <laughs> right, yeah. You know, in this yeah. closed windowless office building in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Yeah. 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 We, we had people, I, I won't mention any names, uh, but there was at least one person who I can think of who said, you know, you can't even mention that I'm here, that I'm, that we use Python oh, I know because, that is. <laughs> because it's a competitive advantage, right? Like, yeah. Interesting. It was just like the fact that they were using Python was a secret, you know? So yeah. Times have really changed quite a bit. But it's kind of it's kind of an important point that Barry and I try and talk about in the talk is what was it like? Did you know? Did we know then that it was a thing? Um, are there things from later in Python that you can trace back to that that origin story? It's yeah. kind of an interesting thought exercise. You don't want to romanticize the past, but at the same time, you know, I think Barry, you and I have kind of a similar impression about kind of how things went down there. Yeah, I mean, again, it's all these little lucky changes, you know, mm -hmm. twists and turns in life and, and technology and things like that. But I think it's really clear. And, and I did a talk in 2018 uh, for Bay Piggies, which is the yeah. Bay, you know, the Bay Area. Um, and I went back and I tried to, you know, download as many versions of Python I couldn't build a single one of them on any like modern OS without wow. changes. Yeah. But I went through like all the change logs and the what's new and things like that. And you can really trace the history of the language all the way through. You can see the thread, mm. you know, from, from even before I, you know, I think it was like version 0 0.91 is the first one you can pull down. And, and you can really see how... Guido's vision for the language that he wanted to put out there is still alive today. It's still really, even through Python 3, through the type hinting, any new feature you want to talk about, the flavor, the the, the sense of Python mm -hmm. still, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a, it feels, it's a, it feels really continuous, you know, yeah. one of the similar thought paths I like to go down or analogies I like to draw is, well, JavaScript came along and did some stuff. And then they said, well, let's add things like type hints and they, and async, and let's make this TypeScript language. In my experience going down that path was, oh, JavaScript is kind of easy. Why is it, why is it so complicated now? There's all these like dependencies and other libraries and libraries of libraries and left padding things. And, and then, you know, it got to TypeScript and I'm like, this is a really frustrating, frustrating addition because 80% of the time it's like, wow, what a cool addition. Oh, wait, this thing I need to use doesn't have some right type definition. So I can't, how come it won't let me use this thing? And somehow Python has managed to grow through the years with those types of additions without going like, oh, why is it, why does it hate me now? Like, why do I have to fight it so much? You know, it just, it's, you can kind of, actually, I think more broadly, this is like a really powerful aspect of Python is that you can use and understand and take as little or as much of it as makes sense for you. Like you can be super effective with a very partial understanding of Python, right? I know how to import modules, call some cool functions. I don't even have to write a, a method. I just put these 10 lines in here and look what amazing thing I did, where so many languages don't do that. And I think that that's a, a really powerful aspect that it has these cool features, but they're not like in your face, like a lot of languages. Yeah, Paul may have, have, have additional thoughts, but I think that's a. I think you're onto something there because I've always considered Python the type of language that really scales with whatever you're trying to do, right? Yeah. If I'm yeah. just going to throw a, you know, I just need a script. I have this. This is kind of a funny thing. Uh, I was upgrading my, one of my machine, my Macs, to Big Sur, and I lost all of my notes for, like, I use I use the Notes app religiously. Right. Right. And, and it should go through iCloud, but because it's Apple, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, sometimes yeah. it just doesn't work. <laughs> so I actually like did a little bit of searching, found the, the SQLite database and played around with the schema, try to figure things out. And then I wrote a little Python script, you know, 
25, 30 lines to just like suck it out of the SQLite database. And, you know, I, I restored all my notes. So yeah, fantastic. even at that yeah, yeah. level, you know, Python's awesome. But then, you know, you can build huge applications in Python, especially with type, you know, the typing, uh, type mm -hmm. hinting. It just scales. Python just scales with with whatever you want to do, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of languages that go to that far end, but you've got to start somewhere in the middle, right? Yeah, yeah. you've got to understand, you know, nullable optional types and no you can't set that to nil because you know just like all that kind of stuff right eventually you might want that but you shouldn't have to have it all the time yeah 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 I my think comment on that is um i guess one of the last talks i gave was at pi colorado which was a wonderful conference and i was actually giving python 1994 there as a keynote and right when i got to the part about spam 2 when we first heard of java no kidding thunder it was like the most <laughs> awesomely theatrical thing. Perfect timing. Oh, you are a dramatic speaker. That was good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've got this look on my face like, okay, you won't believe this. But <laughs> what they told me was at the meetups, like 70% of the people coming to the Python meetups just came to Python less than a year ago. Yeah. And if you look at the Python developer survey, which you were talking about in the most recent Python bytes. Yeah, I was going to say, there's some company, it's called JetBrains, they did this survey. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like 150% of the Python community arrived yesterday, you know? Yeah. yeah. And let's face it, where are they coming from data science? And let's face that, why are they coming to Python? Because, Michael, what you just said. Jump right in, start coding. You don't have to eat your vegetables. Yeah, exactly. I'm trying to find this for us here and find the exact. Um... But actually, I will try to tie it back to our alleged agenda. Um, <laughs> we have an agenda. Who were we discuss. fighting in 1994? Scripting languages. It was Perl and Tickle and then and then and then Python. And we were all lumped into this toy language scripting and the grownups would come back later and reprogram it all in a serious language and stuff like that. And wow, how did that turn out? Yeah. 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 yeah I think there's a lot of special stuff about this, this entry level that is, to me, it feels almost like, like a stealth way to capture people's excitement and energy around programming. It's like, yeah. ah, I'm not a programmer, but I've heard that there's some cool libraries for working with whatever I do, biology, chemistry, whatever, e economics. And if I just import this and do these three lines, like I'll do something really amazing. And probably the, that person's colleagues are like, wow, you are, you're a wizard. How did you do this? Like, well, it was like these four lines. Right. And they just slowly make it a little better and a little better. And they never think of themselves as programmers. And then like two years later, they're building machine learning oh, yeah. put in production oh, yeah. <laughs> with behind flask or fast API. And they're like, how did I get here? Like, I just never even knew I was going to be here. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the magic is uh, you just, you don't get ejected. It's not like, well, I made it sort of this far. Now it's time for a grown up language. Go learn C plus plus and, and be real now. Right. Like that doesn't right. often happen. Here's, right, here's that, the part. Here's the part you're talking about, Paul. That 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 again, the fact that like Python scales from you know throwaway scripts to huge applications, it also really scales to the experience of the person using it. So mm -hmm. it appeals to non-programmers who are just trying to get their other stuff done, right? And they need to do yeah. some programming, but it also somehow also appeals to professional programmers who are building like production level quality, you know, software. There's, it just resonates with both those audiences. Yeah, like, I, what I was, love that. What was Tim Peters doing before Python? Oh yeah, writing compilers for Cray computer. <laughs> oh, that. <laughs> you, got a, you got a problem harder than that? No, I don't. <laughs> well, yeah, I, you know, I, one of the things I think is interesting is I was just reminiscing about talking to Mamo Shemi four or five years ago about Python and the enterprise and how it was kind of a really interesting story that big companies that were not just tech giants, but, you know, boring, quote, boring, like insurance companies and stuff. And I use that in a positive sense right now. Um, they were also using Python in really interesting ways, like Bank of America has like a Python project with 5 million Python, so sorry, 5,000. Python developers and millions of lines of code and like that kind of stuff is 
I think at least when I would talk to people, it felt like that was noteworthy to have those conversations mm-hmm. five years ago. And now it's just like, well, yeah, we are like, why, who would not, like, it'd be insane not do this. Most companies at least have like a data science wing or something that's all about Python, you know, project that from 1994 forward. Like, how does that, like, how did that feel to see it that way now? And what was the perspective back then? Again, this is this is the I, I think the magic secret sauce of Python. Right back then, it was CGI and you know web programming and things like that. And yeah. Python was perfectly suited for that. And now we're you know fast forward thirty years or about, and you know the the domains that are sort of the hot things that everybody needs to be able to do. Python just is malleable. It's just. It just adapts yeah. to that environment. I mean, and a lot of surprising things are Python first now. Like a lot of the ML stuff, which sounds computationally insanely heavy, is still you know Python first because that's the way people want to talk to it. Who cares how it, its guts get over to the GPUs or whatever? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I even saw that that little helicopter rover thing flying around Mars had a little bit of Python involved in it. <laughs> as far I mean, as I can tell, though, the system that they're using. I went to the GitHub repository and poked around. People are like, you know, Python's on Mars, Python's on Mars. I'm like, all right, well, <laughs> let's see some details. As far as I can tell, Python was used to train the models on there, but I don't know that it's execute. There's a bunch of C++ code, and I suspect that's what's actually executing the stuff that was Probably. trained up. But still pretty interesting that it was part of the story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, the things that we talk about now, Bill, async and await, type hints, web stuff, machine learning, like those, a lot of those things, maybe the guild was uh, worth, was really on the radar then, but a lot of the stuff like type hints and, and ML and whatnot are, are fairly new, I suspect. But what kind of things did you all talk about back in 94 and 95 and so on? Like, like what was the important stuff that you had to work out then? The things I remember from the first workshop were the, the, the Don Beaudry Meta meta class hook. Did I steal your thunder? <laughs> I'm sorry, Paul. Go ahead. You can take it. No, hit it. <laughs> Just don't uh, make a don't make a mess of it. <laughs> well, the funny thing was, you know, I had just started getting into Python, so like a lot of that kind of went over my head. I didn't really quite understand because I hadn't looked at the details of of like the implementation of the object model and things like that at the time. So I didn't really understand completely. I sort of understood metaprogramming a little bit, but I didn't quite get what Don and and Guido were talking about at the time. And I think Jim was involved, Jim Fulton was, mm-hmm. as well, because he had, I guess you guys were sort of thinking about Zope or whatever the precursor to Zope was, and he was mm-hmm. thinking about metaprogramming for that. Um, yeah, yeah, and it's weird. I think it was because of Fortran for all for whatever reason, mm-hmm. uh, interfacing Fortran and in, in Python. I might have that wrong, but Don Beaudry. Okay, so I'll, I'll unwind it a little yeah. bit. At that workshop, um, so Michael, some of the things you were just saying, you can't like Barry hinted at before. You can trace back to that workshop. Yeah, yeah. And some yeah. of the problems that needed to be solved there. Um, the things I worked on were none of those. <laughs> um, but I observed the, the useful stuff, uh, and extension C extensions is everything that Barry was just talking about. Yeah. It happens to be the tip of the iceberg on why Python has this sudden resurgence because, you know, NumPy is all under the water in C, but back then it was a mess. And I'm using that as a joke because Don Beaudry's extension ideas and software were called mess. Yeah. And Jim came back <laughs> later with extension class that kind of formalized it. Um, this is kind of gives Genesis to when you briefly in Python two used to import from object or some, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, subclass from object mm-hmm. to kind of get new style objects and stuff like that. That's a little remnant from, uh, I think a little bit from those days. That was more like a Python two thing where the new, like we had classic classes, which were the right. old style class hierarchy, and then the new style classes. They lived mm-hmm. together for a long, you know, until yeah. Python three, obviously. Uh, and you had to either you had to basically like inherit from object or yeah. set your meta class, dunder meta class sure. attribute to do it. Um, 
But back, but the point is, back in those days, uh, interfacing to the big pile of C code was such a big deal because we were the kid little toy scripting language. Right. You know, yeah. and um, it's it's just so interesting to me that we went through a phase of outgrowing that, and you had these enormous systems that are mostly the waters being carried in Python. Now back to the chief yeah. value proposition is run that crap on the GPU and let the programmers hang out in Python. Right. Yeah. Or some distributed grid computing, or yeah. I don't want to know where, just run it in, in a low level thing. And I want to talk to it in this simple, clean API. Yeah. 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 The irony of course, I think is that in a lot of ways, the C API is holding us back now. Sure. To, yeah. to be yeah. honest with yeah. you, you know, there, there, yeah. there are, the, the you, you want to change the memory management model to be more GC or do a JIT? It, it's all easy except for those little pointers you passed off. Who knows what happens now, right? Exactly. And the macros that are used to access tuples and you know so on and so forth. References, those are all issues that are holding back, I think. I mean, that's sort of the way I think about it is there's nothing wrong with Python, the language today that would prevent it from being the language of, of choice 30 years from now. But, right. you know, we're, we're, we're also dealing with, you know, C, the C Python interpreter is a 30 year old VM. And we've learned a thing or two about like how to write, you know, high performance VMs in that time. And getting the C Python implementation modernized to the point where we can do things like potentially remove the gill or, you know, adopt a GC or, all those kinds of things that we want to do, yeah. we have to now deal with 30 years of backwards compatibility. And that's, and that's a difficult problem to, so, you know, both a technical yeah. and a social problem to overcome. Well, yeah, we're older than Java. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the other thing I think, Barry, that is, makes that really significant is there's the technical problem. I think, honestly, you could say, we're going to just change the way it works and the important stuff's going to get upgraded and the stuff that hasn't been touched for five years, it's just going to have to run on the old thing. And we could just move forward, right? That would be fine. But I look at the difference between Python 2 and Python 3, and they seem really small to me, right? A little bit with strings and bytes. Totally. A little bit on classes, a few things. And that was that was existentially bad, that, that, that disjoint eight-year period where the core developers are working on one thing and so many other people are like, well, we're not going to touch that thing. We're just going to work on, right? That was not a good deal. And the types of changes that you all are talking about, while maybe awesome, they seem more significant than that, at least. And I, I suspect that people, at least for a while, are not willing to stomach another round of that. What do you think? I actually, I think if, if there ever will, is a Python 4, and I kind of doubt there will be a Python 4, I think it's not going to be at the Python level. You know, mm. to, to the extent that it's possible to like, for example, remove the gill and yeah. not require Python level changes, which is still questionable, but it's all good. It's all going to be at the C API, you know, at, at the FFI sort of level, right? It's going right. to be the things that Python integrates with that are going to change significantly. And I think that's to, you know, if I had my magic hat on with, you know, a million dollars and, you know, I don't <laughs> know, a few, that, a few tens of people to work on it, that's what I would do. Yeah, uh, you could change the way it runs without changing the language whatsoever, right? That would be totally fine. Yeah, yeah. And and I don't think there's any magic. Like if, you know, when I talk to people who have worked on JavaScript VMs or uh, other VMs, like we know what to do. It's no, there's no magical thing that we have to go figure out. This has all been done over and over again. Not that I could do it, but, you know, experts in building VMs could certainly yeah. do it. Uh, but the, it's it's managing that the, I think the social side, like what do you do about NumPy and all the C extensions yeah. that are out there? That's that's really that's a that that's a big that's a big ask. Um, Eric Snow's effort with sub interpreters is kind of generated a lot of what about us from NumPy? And yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's one of the attempts to not. Uh, remove the gill not a galectomy but a let's just have many gills and they can all coexist right right yeah. right right yeah. right yeah. yeah so just uh sort of on this historical like broad 
picture kind of journey we're on. You know, you mentioned like Barry, you mentioned JavaScript, uh, JITs and, and VMs. Does it surprise you guys what has happened with JavaScript and its performance and stuff? This this thing that just ran in web browsers and now it's they've gotten it to perform reasonably well. I don't know, to me, I just never saw that little thing going where it's ended up either. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, it doesn't really surprise me too much because I think, and Paul probably understands this, you know, like languages are a lot like editors, right? Like they're re there's a religious part, mm -hmm. not maybe not religious, but there's a, there's an, an identity tribalism. Part. Yeah, tribalism with yeah. it. That's a, that's a great or emotional connection to it. Mm -hmm. You know, people love love Python and they want to use it, and you know that that gets them into that world. There's a lot of people whose first real experience with programming is sort of web web technologies, mm -hmm. JavaScript, CSS, HTML, especially like that. in the boot camp side of things these days. They've all seemed uh, to have yeah. really really uh, glommed on to that. Uh, almost, I think, to detriment for folks. But you know, I think they've they've generated too many just front end developers and not like broad skilled folks. But anyway, that's a side story. Yeah. So you know, people are that's you know, young people come in and they learn JavaScript and they enjoy it and they can you know get see the results immediately in their browser and do really yeah. cool things. And so I think it's a natural pro progression to want to be able to take that environment or that experience and move it into other domains and. Some, you know, JavaScript seems to be, you know, pretty malleable about that, you know. So what about having uh, one of the value propositions in the JavaScript world is it's JavaScript all the way down. Um, you know, could it be Python all the way down, right? Like in the reverse direction, sort of. What, what do you guys think of the opportunity of WebAssembly and that to sort of like expand the places that Python is happy? Yeah. Paul, you want to... Sure, and um, I know you did a uh, podcast with Brett about this at the yeah. last Icon. and we did a live one. Yeah, exactly. We talked about the and, opportunity um, of, of Rust and WebAssembly for sure. for yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, they kind of go together. So, in theory, that should be like Python's big chance to kind yeah. of because Python. I, I and this is the my little passion project uh, working on the weekends about Python and the modern web and Python's mm -hmm. web story and and there's a lot of hope misplaced in my opinion on uh wasm as a silver bullet for python um heavy lift to kind of get there and the destination probably won't be what you think um but at the same time uh it has opportunities that i don't think we quite understand and appreciate from a platform that we could benefit even on the server side even on the mobile side to be yeah. not just producers of wasm but consumers of wasm yeah, yeah, there's a really cool Python library that will let you interop with any Wasm language. Yes. I forgot what it's called, but it's not in the browser. It's just you know locally. Sure, right. mm -hmm. You get some Wasm library that could be written in C, it could be written in Java, whatever compiles down to that, you know, Rust. And then I'm going to use that in Python. I'm glad you're bringing up, and, I, and it's nice to tie it in a way that uh, 1994... Um, because I do care a lot about Python and the web and I worry and I give talks about Python and the modern web, but it's interesting, a name we didn't mention kind of along your lines of JavaScript kind of eating the world and maybe Michael Kennedy's talk JavaScript to me coming to a theater near you. sometimes. <laughs> so. um, and the one that came out of nowhere and ate the world in the first third of Python was PHP. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. And it should have run off. It should have hit its ceiling. And uh, maybe a little bit like x86, maybe a little bit like JavaScript, maybe like a whole bunch of other things that should have jumped the shark. There were plenty of sharks left to jump. <laughs> and PHP got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and was being used for things that never should have been used for because of the law of large numbers. And we just got to be worried about the law of large numbers with uh, JavaScript as well. Yeah, for sure. John Sheehan says, transcript. Transcript. Yes. 
I have for my little secret project actually originated with uh, generating some transcript from Python side components. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. You know, a world that I would love to see is like the reason that JavaScript is so popular is it's an, a non avoidable requirement because it's the thing that all the browsers ship with that have a runtime. Yeah. With WebAssembly, it's totally simple to compile C Python over there. There's things that don't work and there's maybe some edges you got to fix. Probably also for the JVM, probably also for the .NET runtime. Like all these runtimes, they could be put into this form. If the browsers would sh ship language runtimes, if they would just yeah. go, our browser includes Py uh, C Python, includes .NET, includes Java. Oh, it also includes JavaScript. Like that would just change the game. But because every alternative is like, well, you need a 20 meg download. Well, that's a different, like, oh, well, that's not going to work, right? The browser people could decide. There's only like two of them left in the world. <laughs> Maybe three if you count Safari. But like really, it's Chrome and then Firefox and the little Safari it wouldn't be that hard to say, let's try to make some of these other languages available as runtimes through mm -hmm. WebAssembly. We already do WebAssembly, just ship the binary and we'll be good to go. Yeah. I would love to see that, but I'm not seeing any movement there. Yeah, Barry has a story about JavaScript and Python. <laughs> you know, it's funny you mentioned that because I was going to say that, but I, I have since learned that it's not actually true. Okay. <laughs> So I'm going to skip that one. <laughs> I was uh, watching Brendan Ike's podcast and I was waiting for him to say it and he didn't. So yeah, I, I have a colleague here at, at uh, LinkedIn who kind of hooked me, I, not directly up with Brendan, but you know, I, I, sure. I was like, am I misremembering this story? And yeah, it's kind of yeah. true. I was misremembering yeah. the story. So. I like your story though. It's great. <laughs> <a> great story. <laughs> it just wasn't true. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. RJL out there says that'd be a great idea, Michael. What if what's stopping Google and Firefox from doing that? I don't know. Market forces. Well, yeah. I mean, to be fair, Microsoft has created this thing called Blazor that put the .NET runtime in there. Yeah. You just got to download it, right? So I would not actually be surprised to see that ship with Edge at some point. But that idea across, uh, at least let I think JavaScript's fine, but let's let it compete on fair playing ground, right? Like, mm -hmm. Right. Where it, the other languages could possibly even be an option. So that would be fantastic for everyone, I think. Yeah. And with WebAssembly, there's some interop, so, so who knows? So, you know, looking, looking forward, like, are you guys just astonished that that group of 20 people, 1994, worked on this project? And then, you know, you get articles like that, um, that tech one that I had about, you know, Python is eating the world of software sort of thing. Like these are really big gaps. Did you guys ever imagine that you were onto, you know, a flame that would burn so bright? Paul, oh, do you want to? <laughs> uh, uh, it, this is, you and I talk about this kind of in the closing a little bit. Um, and it's related to the why. How did Python get to where it got to? What were the ingredients? Could you trace it back to then? And when we gave the talk the first time at the keynote panel at PyCon, Jim Fulton actually brought this up, uh, that people talk about the Python community being so kind and human, and it's because Guido's kind and human. Yep. Yeah. And so kind of put into the DNA back to 1994 was a person and a group of people around who valued those kinds of things at a time when other language communities had a bad reputation for those kinds of things. Uh, Barry, you want to expand on that? I think it's I think it was Brett Cannon who coined the term. I came yeah. for the language and stayed for the community. And yep. uh, that is so true. I mean, you know, my my closest friends and in, in, in many ways, I mean, Guido actually lives not far from me now. And <laughs> I love just kind of getting together with him. And a lot of times we don't even talk about Python, you know, yeah, I, mean, sure. I, I have, you know, I have some of my really valued friends I've met through Python. So it's I think it does come down to Guido's leadership as far as personality and the kind of community that he helped foster. Mm -hmm. It's, it feels very inclusive and very, mm -hmm. you know, positive and like empowering to people. 
you know, and I just, I just really think that, that the community has done as much as the language to sort of build up where, you know, build Python to where it is today. Michael, I'll try and get back to your question a little bit with a little bit of an anecdote. Um, <laughs> All right. My role in the play uh, was never <laughs> technical, um, but I brought, I, I made coffee for the, the smart people. Uh, and I would do some of the organization stuff like the PSA and PSF with Greg Stein. And then I went away for a while and lived in Europe, didn't go to PyCons, came back and damn, if Capital One didn't have a booth at PyCon. Yeah. That blew me away. Back when we had Spam 1, Spam 2, Spam 3, this NIST workshop, to think that would be an outcome. Yeah. And that these like really serious major players felt like, wow, we got to go do this. It's just uh, astonishing to me. Yeah, uh, for me as well. And I'm... You know, I'm thinking back to the job fair that was in the 2020 PyCon. You know, walking around there, you just so many people are like, you know, we're hiring, we're building these Python teams to build our software, and some were, you know, the usual suspects, but many yeah. of them were not. Many of them were, like you said, like Capital One type of places. You're like, you guys are doing this? Wait, I mean, really? Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super, super interesting, and I feel like the the sentiment has shifted a little bit it used to be like all oh, these these corporate entities are going to come in and like muck up our culture mm. and like break they're going to corrupt some of the they're going to be somewhat corrupting influences and i feel like i don't really see that that's happened so much so i'm happy for that i feel like if anything it's been um a supporting type of thing to have this much opportunity in this ecosystem yeah, absolutely and something uh, I'll add to that is uh, as much as we cherish Python to language, a perhaps not equal achievement, but an important achievement is the PSF. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's underappreciated because Barry and I were responsible for the failed predecessor, <laughs> Python's overactivity. <laughs> These things require a number of ingredients and they require heroes and in the middle third of Python, um, the PSF and PyCon emerged. And these are important achievements. Yeah. Many people so are, are probably aware, but I suspect many are not who are listening. How important PyCon is for funding the PSF in general, right? That's m the vast majority of their income mm -hmm. is yeah. through, through that. And honestly, it was a, a big scare. And what's going to happen when COVID hit? Uh, they waited to the very last minute to cancel PyCon when the writing was clearly on the wall that people cannot go there. But it's like, well, we got to just figure out all the finances. Right? It was a big deal, right? Yeah, huge. And uh, let me echo uh, Paul because the PSF and the folks, e e Eva and E and, and all the people who are involved in, in the PSF, I, I, I can't even go through all the names. They do such great work and important work for the Python ecosystem and the Python community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, kudos to every single one of them because they're just fantastic people and it's a great organization. And, you know, the, the PSF is, you know, not only supports what Python is today, but it really looks ahead, you know? So like on the steering council, we work very closely with the PSF to try to understand, you know, how can we, you know, utilize the the um, the PSF to help fund important work. For example, that that Python the language or, or C Python the implementation really needs. So, you know, that's a great partnership. Uh, I think that's kind of built up over the over the years. Um, yeah, and there was just a big announcement that Google became the first visionary sponsor of the PSF, which is like three hundred ninety thousand dollars a year, or something like yeah. that, in hiring a core developer in residence. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's Huge another sign of, of, of big support coming along. Yeah. Maybe yeah. to close out this topic, if anybody out there has concerns about the PSF or like really deep-seated problems with it, and you see me and Barry sometime, get us to tell you about the Python <laughs> software. Yeah. <laughs> You'll right. feel a lot better about the PSF. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> So on our little screen share here, I put up the the new Python, the latest Python.org compared to the 1997 one. 
And it just occurred to me one thing that I went like years without knowing is there's this little prompt looking yeah. icon right on the homepage. If, if you click that, it oh, oh, it's not working anymore. Oh my goodness. Let's, Live demos, man. <laughs> yeah, I guess it doesn't work right now. Maybe the Python Anywhere folks just have a look at this. But yeah. Probably it'll work by I'll, then. I'll, I'll, I'll get on the Slack channel. and <laughs> Yeah, yeah, let them know. But I was really surprised. You can go there and click and it just open up the Python REPL, I think running in Python Anywhere, generally speaking. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Very, very interesting. Yeah. All right. Let's, it's a let's, cool service they've done for the community for that. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's very easy to just kind of get started because, you know, tracing that sort of very partial understanding of Python, what comes with that is also a partial understanding of Linux, a partial understanding mm -hmm. of servers, partial understanding of SSH, partial, like all these tools that you just become so familiar with to weave this stuff together. In the beginning, it's, these are major roadblocks. You're like, how am I going to do this thing? Like, there's these steps I need to learn and, and services like that that make it real easy and welcoming are, are pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. So let's round out our conversation uh, with two quick thoughts. One for, uh, from both you guys. So you're probably seeing some really big opportunities that the Python ecosystem can take advantage of and, and grow around. And there's probably also some, some dangers or some threats that we should maybe be aware of, um, you know, Russell Keith McGee gave a really talk, interesting talk about black swan events and, and Python and so on and yeah. stuff like that. So what do you think? Opportunities, things we should be worried about or pay attention to? Paul, you want to take, you want to, you want to take it? Um, there's one that popped in my head. It may have been because you mentioned Russell's wonderful black swan talk, which was kind of followed in my mind by Lucas Longa's Pi Londinium talk, which covered mm -hmm. some of the same territory. Um, but what I'll talk about instead is the threat that wasn't, or I'll, I'll talk about a couple of threats that, that weren't, if that's okay. Is that yeah, cheating? Yeah. No, that's not fine. I think that's, that's right. an awesome history lesson. Tell us. Yeah. Um, I remember going to see Guido when he was still with Google. God, Barry, how long ago would that have been? 10, 12, 10 years? Yeah, at least, yeah. Yeah. And even at that time, I was like, it kind of struck me going over to go see him in downtown San Francisco that he was in the process of handing over the reins. How many yeah. successful projects, especially open source projects, don't outlive the founder? Yeah, true. Yeah. And um, he's done wonderfully at that over the years. Uh, and in fact, his participation now appears to be because I want to, not because yeah. I have to. <laughs> like I'm retired. I'll wait. No, I'm just going to play around. This Indeed. It's, it's <laughs> right. so that, that was a threat. Yeah. That, that was a threat that wasn't. And then another yeah, the threat whole formation that of the steering yeah. council and what was going to happen when he retired yeah, right. and his. You guys got to figure it out. This is not on me. I'm indeed. You got to. Yeah. Not gotta live just in what you who it will be. Figure out how actually how, what system. Of how it was gonna like? Yeah, exactly. How it was gonna work? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is a wonderful act of humility on his part. Uh, he didn't view himself as essential to answering that question. And I think he really trusted the community to come up with the right mm -hmm. answers. You know. Um, it was a really interesting time. And I, I do think that the community came together and, you know, we, there was lots of discussion about how to do it. And uh, it, it really, it really worked out. And I think that that set Python up for yeah. this kind of longevity and continued sure. success and continued relevance uh, in yep. technology. Yeah. So then I'll do, I'll do my other non-threat and then finally give you an answer <laughs> on the threat. Another non-threat uh, that didn't happen was peak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And right at the time when the peak should have happened, maybe the first peak should have happened. I'll, and Barry, please. I, in fact, I would love Michael to do a show on the actual story behind the story on this. Jessica McKellar. Yep. In the middle third of Python, the PSF and PyCon as an engine of revenue and then as an engine of gender diversity mm -hmm. and yeah. bringing in a big, new, important, viable, a vi lot of vitality audience into Python. 
then on the way to data science doing the same thing. So at a time when it should have perhaps been cresting, it did a double dip inflection point. Uh, do you want to comment on that, Barry, before I go to an actual question? Uh, no, but I, but I think that's one of the wonderful things about the Python community, you know. Yeah. Uh, and it's not just sort of, I mean, it's not just on a gender. Like, it's also, you know, getting young people involved. Sure. I, I think that's been a fantastic thing is to, is to go to PyCon and see, you know, kid, like, you know, secondary school kids yeah. and how it's being taught in, in colleges. And, and I've, I've Your always... son and my son went to the Young Coders on a yeah. long time and ago. I, I have to tell you, I have to tell you, I'm super proud because my son is actually uh, working in, he's using Python at work these days. So it's like, yes, it's awesome. That's fantastic. Uh, He's going to be out earning you pretty soon, Barry. (laughs) Hopefully. (laughs) One could hope as a parent, right? Exactly. Uh, (laughs) so my actual threat will go back to Russell and Lucas and man, I worry about Python and the web. I worry that what we've said is we've seeded the user interface to JavaScript frameworks in the browser. And we're perfectly happy just shoving REST and JSON to them. And what worries me is... They might just decide, like, why are we doing this other stuff? We're almost all the way there. Like, let's just, come on, let's just Mm -hmm. go express. If you're a business decision maker and you're like, okay, I've got two teams. Why don't we got two teams? Hmm. And the one I value is the one that puts the pixels that are sexy. They show me the shiny buttons and bits. Yeah, And then as this modern web stuff kicks in and website performance really, really, really becomes a thing and people pre-render on the server, so your React components have to be pre-rendered on the server, which means you have to run React on the server and you can't run React in Python. So, um, right, the that, pressure that, to make it not... I spend a lot of time thinking about. Yeah, make it not load with empty curly braces and then pop in yeah. all of a sudden. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a concern, yeah. I think the other thing that I'll add is uh, Python on mobile, right? Like yeah. uh, everybody's got a phone in their pocket, mm-hmm. yep. you know, and Python doesn't have a super great story there. Yeah. Things like, you know, you know there, we have micro Python, which has its place, you know, you know, as smart homes, as, you know, IOT and all those things, you know, become more and more important in our lives. I think Python needs to have a better story for mobile as well. Mm-hmm. So those are two yeah. two big challenges. Yeah, if you're going to ask me to make that, I guess I would have said mobile as well. I think yeah. I think the saving grace there maybe is that mobile is so messed up. Also, <laughs> like there's <laughs> it's so tricky. You got these different languages, but they have these weird constraints, and then you've got to go through the app store gatekeeper people, and that's real. Like, um, yeah, it's less of a straight. It's it's a more narrow ecosystem because you basically yeah, but have it's, two exactly, but it's also one of the most important ones, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. it's where the really really interesting stuff is these days. Yeah. Um, a, a couple of comments from the live stream. Robert Robbins says, uh, "I'd love to have learned Python in the mid '90s when I started learning programming. My life would be totally different now." <laughs> and John Sheehan says, "The okay. Item Project looks really interesting." Mm-hmm. Yeah, indeed. All right. Well, those are the the downer sides of things. Um, Paul, one thing I would like to say about the web, I I do feel like there's a really interesting resurgence in the Python web frameworks. Yeah. Now that the Python three, that it was sort of crossed over and they're like, let's just take advantage of all the modern Python goodies. Yeah. Things like fast API starlet, uh, as well as some other ones like Django Ninja and whatnot are coming along to do interesting things that make it feel really refreshing to do Python web stuff. And I still think there's interesting things that are happening there that are, are compelling. Like I was talking to somebody, I can't remember the context, but they had a Django system and some of the Django views were regular Python, but they actually did some of them in Cython because they had like really high performance requirements. And like the views were computed in, in Cython, which is, I mean, these are really interesting use cases that are, are out there. Mm-hmm. All right, really quick, we're running low on time. Opportunities, what do you guys see as the big opportunity? That's that's a great question because I think it also comes into sort of predicting where technology is going in the next few years. 
And I don't really know that I can do that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I've been surprised over and over and over again in my career. So, um, again, I, I really think, I really think it comes down to the appeal of Python, the language. And really, one of the things I think Guido did, you know, back in the Jython days when JPython was the thing and that became Jython, was he recognized the need to sort of separate the language evolution from the implementation. Now, the reality is, you know, we've had multiple implementations of Python over the years and, you know, essentially C Python is still the, the most popular version. But it doesn't have to be that way. And yeah. I think... I think, you know, as big companies have more and more Python in their, in their ecosystem of technology, I think it becomes more imperative to, to, for them to kind of step up and, you know, help fund those kind of, like, I, I really think if we could just, you know, hit some of those big people, you know, big companies that we talked about, get a million dollars from each of them. And you could do some really incredible stuff with Python. Uh, yep. and, and they would benefit way more than that million dollars. Totally. Right. Yeah. Yep. Especially in Wall Street. If yep. you could make their <laughs> trades one millisecond quicker. Yep. Boom. Like that's that's just like printing money right there. So and, and there's more no important. What 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 can't they do? Hire people fast enough. So yeah. make your current people more productive. Exactly. Yeah. And there's no reason why it can't be done. Like I said, we, we have the organization because the PSF is solid and knows how to do this, knows yeah. how to manage these projects, right? Is a non-for-profit, so there's no favoritism going on there. Uh, the, we have the technologists who can make this happen. So The track I, record to show the, that they can do it? Exactly. So I think, I, to me, that is the biggest opportunity. And if I saw that come together... And that's and those are some of the things that the PSF and the steering council are trying to, you know, sure. put together. So that is so exciting because it could yeah. be an amazing, you know, twenty five years of, of more Python. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'll throw one out there for you all. Uh, for a while, there was this language called Java. You guys talked about it, <laughs> and that was seemed to be the language of the first year computer science program. When I did computer science, I took a couple of classes. I, my degree is in math, but I took a couple of computer science classes and that was um, Scheme and Lisp, which I don't feel was the best option necessarily, but that's what I did. But for yeah. a long time, it was Java. I think the big opportunity is so many people are learning Python from the very beginning that now it's in this place of, well, why not Python instead of why Python? Right. Mm -hmm. If you're already yeah. working, you're already comfortable, you've already done projects in it, you, you've had success like, well, yeah, I could use other languages, but why not? One thing that I think really is really interesting about this Stack Overflow trends I have up on our screen shares. Do you notice how there's two humps every year for yeah. Java? And, and a lot of the other ones, they don't have those humps, but Java has two humps a year. Huh. Those are fall semester and spring semester. <laughs> yeah. How interesting. interesting. Yeah. Those humps are going away at the end a little bit. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So and they're kind of coming into the Python world. So yeah, I think it's really interesting. I, I think that's the opportunity is uh, for the communities. There are many fresh and excited young people coming in, yeah. uh, much like your survey showed that professional coding experience, the most common option was less than a year for Python yeah. developers, right? So there's a lot of fresh and exciting people coming in. And I think that's all good. I'll give an opportunity that's similar to that, which is also non-technical, which is people oriented, which is um, in the most recent Python bytes, Brian used a clever expression about the long tails getting fatter or something like that. I can't remember what the context was about. Um, the PSF diversity and inclusion working group. Expanding yes. the yeah. footprint of Python in next level markets and yeah. populations and groupings of people with uh, passions and interests. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Those, I mean, the, be, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna say, these are all really super important things because, you know, 
Paul and I have been, you know, involved in Python for a long time, right? Like, and, you know, and as Guido retired, you know, someday, hopefully, you know, <laughs> right? Uh, and I think it's really important. Like, I, I feel the responsibility more and more to help mentor younger people who are coming into, you know, technology in general, but also into the Python community and really nurture that mm -hmm. engagement because that's the energy that's going to, that's going to, you know, propel Python forward. So, you know. Hey, Michael, yeah. I got to give you a pat on the back. You've become yeah. a place to give a voice to the next generation of stars. So oh, kudos thanks, to you for that. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's really nice. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think one of the things that I've tried to do is to try to find people that have really interesting stories of like how Python has like massively empowered them, even mm. if they haven't built the most popular open source project or they don't work at the biggest company. Sometimes that story of, you know, nothing to, to something really powerful, even though not too many people know about it is really quite amazing. So yeah, yeah try to tell that. Uh, speaking of the education side, RJL says at our science center, we teach Python to STEM students, grades five to eight. It's been You're the hero. Successful. Yeah, man. Yeah. Awesome. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. For the sake of time, I'm going to cut our <laughs> final two questions down to one question each. Barry, I'm going to give it to you first because you're a bit of an unknown. Paul, I'll see if I can guess his answer. If you're going to write some Python code, what editor do you use? Emacs. Emacs, right on. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. <laughs> I expect nothing less. Barry. All right, Paul. Paul, what are you feeling? What are you doing these days? I have... Uh, PyCharm open right now. Do you? Awesome. Fantastic. Yeah, I I don't have it open now, but I'm loving that you guys built it for the M1. It's so nice to work with these days. Yeah, yeah very yeah. good. I, it's a great tool. I think it's it's really good for helping people get into it, but also like it's, yeah, it, it scales, it scales as well. It's great. Well, to speak, to speak for other products as well, we're seeing the rise of smart editors and smart tool chains for Python. I think that's fantastic for everybody and all of us. Yeah. yeah. It's it's really cool. I mean, you know, I I I I acknowledge my, you know, minority status as <laughs> as an Emacs user even in like the text space. Like there's a, many more Vim users. Uh, but I I can see, you know, my colleagues at work that, you know, what they use and it's really fantastic to see like all the amazing support that yep. these that these modern editors have for yeah. uh python yeah i you agree know, they take some of these ideas like type hints and stuff and like yes amplify yeah. their value yeah and and integration with you know static checkers and linters and mypy type checkers and you know all that kind of stuff is like those are really important tools for for the modern python you know developer and it's great to see all that stuff really well integrated yeah fantastic well thank you both for being on the show you want to give a final thought, a final comment to the people out there thinking on this historical sort of arc that we've been covering? <laughs> what do you want to say? Uh, want to go first, Barry? Sure. <laughs> um, I'll say this. Python is where it is today because of the people who have gotten involved over yeah. the years, right? Yeah. And... You know, I talk to some folks who are like, well, I don't know, I can't, I, I don't know C, so I can't be involved in Python development. No, that's not true. In fact, you don't even need to be a programmer necessarily to be involved in Python development. Everybody is welcome and everybody's valued. So if you like Python, get involved. That might be with the PSF, it might be with the language design, whatever it is, education. Your favorite open source project that's not strictly under C Python. Exactly, exactly. All these things are available to anybody. There's no cost other than an internet connection and, a, you know, and a browser or an editor or something like that. Everybody can get involved. And I really encourage, I encourage everyone to sort of change the mindset of these are the barriers. So therefore, I can't get involved to these are the opportunities that I can shine and grow and learn. And so I, I think you know, it's the people. It always comes down to the, yeah. to the, to the folks. Yeah. That's a great sentiment. Paul. Uh, maybe in a similar vein, um, thinking about 1994 and driving back from girls across practice to come <laughs> and be on the show. <laughs> I was thinking about, you know, most people in their lives, they'll have something they're really passionate about. 
but then a decade passes and their life changes and they have kids or something. Got to buy they, like a red convertible. Something. Yeah, and then they, <laughs> so they stay. change over to something else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah. then their kids move out of the house and their passion changes to something else. So during these decades of their lives, <laughs> they really latch on to something, believe deeply in it. It's part of their identity, but then they move on. And I think about for, for Barry and me, and it's, I, I get to be on the show with the fluffle <laughs> and it's wonderful. <laughs> the friendly language uncle for life. That's and a good story I'm going too. through those three decades and still, if I was to self-assess who I am, what's my identity, who's my tribe, it's Python and the web. And it's mm -hmm. still the thing I believe in It's how lucky am I? Yeah, I mean, that's just just a graceful way to have the years go by. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here, Paul. It, it's been an amazing journey. You know, that's not over yet, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, and Python ha gave me a life. You know, it really yeah. did. Uh, so I, I'm so grateful to the language, the community, to Guido, to everybody, Paul, you know, everybody that I meet, you know, uh, Python's really an amazing, been an amazing experience, a great ride. Yeah. It's one of those types of things you can wake up and go, I get to do this. Like, I don't have yeah, to yeah, do this. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, can you believe I get to do this? They're going to pay yeah. me for this. I would have done this for free. Yeah. That mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Yeah, it's fantastic. All right. Well, let's leave it there. Thank you both for being on the show. It's been really Michael, great. Thank to you chat. so much. Thank you for yeah. having us. Yeah, yeah, it's been great. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.